On Valentine's Day, February 14, 1967, Saddleback Junior College District was born and dubbed the Sweetheart College. The first faculty faced the awesome task of creating a place where students could thrive. The heart of Saddleback College lies in those early days of discovery and historical events which shaped the lives of faculty and the students they served. This is the story of dreams and those who helped create them. Making history, Saddleback College. I was uh, uh, hired at Saddleback College in August of 1968, uh, going to work in September. But my first uh, interview at Saddleback College, uh, when I came down here, I didn't know what, I, what job I was interviewing for. Uh, I just said, oh, I got an interview, so here I am. And uh, so I got here, it was kind of a general interview. and. Uh, talked about me and uh, my philosophy and the things that I'd done. Of course, I had a short haircut, which was important in those days. And uh, from there, I got a second interview, uh, which was very general also. Supposed to be, uh, oh, about a couple weeks later. Again, I still don't know what job I'm interviewing for. And uh, the night before I got my final interview, Jack Roper, who was the first president superintendent, had resigned uh, the night before the board meeting, and so I met again with the same people I'd already met with. And we went to the Mission Vale Country Club and had a couple, and uh, that's where I really kind of found out that I, I had the job. But I wasn't still sure what job it was, but it was the coordinator of student activities. Like most of the faculty from the Performing and Fine Arts through Doyle McKinney. I was at uh, Whittier School District, and Fullerton College District and taught with him for three years and he went back east and then he was hired as one of the administrators for the first year of the college. The interview was interesting because it was in a model home. I was teaching at San Jose State and um, I'd just come to San Jose State from General Electric Company and I decided to get into teaching as what I really wanted my passion in life and San Jose State was more academically oriented, more um, theoretically oriented, not as much student oriented. So I decided to search for a community college and I wanted to come south where the sun was, where the surf was. And so I interviewed around here in a couple of different community colleges and I heard about Saddleback and came down here and fell in love with the idea of starting something brand new and uh, kicking off a new program. So here I am. I was the first full-time member who was hired other than the division chairs. Uh, I was hired before, I, <laughs> I understand many people had um, uh, different questions asked of them later on in the interviewing process uh, because it was a very conservative board that we had in those days and they didn't want to have any radicals. So um, uh, I tried to not sound too radical naturally when I was being hired 
but they hired me and uh, I came in before any of these these strange questions were asked of people like what is your party affiliation and things that are just totally against the law now. Okay, I came to be hired. It was actually uh, Jim Thorpe that hired me and I think I'm almost positive of this that I was the last person hired the first year and there were some 30 or 32 of us and I had written this uh, I taught at Costa Mesa High and I'd written this I figured I wanted to get this job and I'm not going to get it if I don't have something special so I put that I was the, the best that there was which I believe still and Thorpe to his credit didn't hold it against me he said some people did he said some people thought that was arrogant thing to do and uncalled for but I said hell I gotta get some you know what I mean instead of just routine stuff I had to do something different so that's how I got in here in physics I was the last one they they were gonna wait I think a year to hire a physicist or something like that it happened that my friends here told me that there was a wonderful new community college that had been voted into existence on Valentine's Day and was going to open the following year in South Orange County. And of course this caught my attention because that meant it was within commuting distance of Laguna Beach, which is my favorite place in the whole world. What a dream to be able to teach in a brand new college and live in the place I love more than any place else in the world. And it happened that the person who was chosen to be the first dean of the fine arts division was Doyle McKinney, who had been the dean of instruction at the high school where I had taught in the Fullerton district. So he invited me to apply, which I did with great joy. And as you probably know, we're talking about the 60s here. This is before there were so many legal complications to the hiring process and the early administrators of the college who knew people that they thought were qualified and would be suitable for the job could do that and so I flew out here in the spring and interviewed and on my way back to New York because of course the school year wasn't out and I couldn't not finish out the year there. I went up to the Disneyland Hotel to take the limousine back to the airport and I had a little bit of time to wait and I remember walking around it was so beautiful and so clean and and the flowers just everywhere and I cried. <laughs> I realized how much I missed California and how desperately I wanted to come down here and be a part of the foundation of the new college and it happened. I uh, was interviewed for a teaching job, <coughs> teaching journalism, but I ended up with another job, a job, uh, uh, it was, it was uh, one title and many jobs, I wore many hats. So uh, I was hired as director of community services and of course director, had, you know, we had a superintendent, uh, <coughs> president, which would be like a chancellor president now, and we didn't have uh, the deans, we had chairman. But anyway, I was director of uh, community services, which uh, meant that I, I handled the uh, information for the community, for the students, for the faculty, of course, programs for the faculty, and uh, for uh, the community, and for the students when they arrived. But it was really a PR with a capital PR. We did lots of public relations. And, uh, and after that, then, uh, into teaching uh, with the journalism after students arrived. But uh, we had to uh, tell them about the campus. It uh, was voted in by the people in uh, 1967, February 14th. I guess you've heard that story. They called it the sweethearts of Orange County because of that. But uh, we had to, then to tell the, the, the uh, prospective students about the college and really convinced them that it was going to be a great college and we had we were hiring great people and that we were going to have great people because at that time <coughs> uh, a student didn't have a choice to go to another college you had to go to the college uh, in the district uh, where your residence was and so they couldn't go to Orange Coast they couldn't go to Santa Ana and we wanted to tell them that they were lucky they were going to come to uh, Saddleback College and they were too.
I was teaching at Costa Mesa High School, and I was teaching part-time at Orange Coast College, and I was thinking, gee, it would really be nice to teach in a community college. And my husband happened to see in the newspaper that a new college was being formed and that they were accepting applications. So I thought, oh, the timing was just right. I had taught 10 years on the high school level, and it was time to graduate. So I put in an application, and I waited, and I waited, and I was thrilled to death when I got called in for an interview. And I think it was three interviews before the final selection was made, so I was very fortunate. And I remember my husband said, well, don't feel too bad if you don't get it, because you'll get it next year. It was seven years before they hired another person for what I was teaching. I uh, was interviewed, and I think it was in a... Uh an apartment house or something like that. It, was, it definitely was not in any official kind of building. And uh, it, I went upstairs and sat down in front of Fred Bremer and with Doyle McKinney. And I do remember that Doyle McKinney asked me just the right question because I had just read an article on the new poetry and then he asked me a question about that, and I was able to really, you know, come on as if I knew what I was talking about. And that impressed them. Uh, Doyle McKinney looked at Fred Bremer, and he went like this. And, and then Fred Bremer said, uh, well, uh, do you like her better than uh, so-and-so, whoever they had just uh, decided on? And Doyle said, yes. So um, I was the first English teacher hired. The campus actually started up on the site where the hospital is today, Mission Viejo Hospital. And uh, we were up there for one year with temporary buildings. And uh, they hadn't purchased the land yet, and they were negotiating for the land, and then they purchased this land that the campus is on now, which is some 200 acres. And the buildings that were located up on the hospital site, temporary buildings, were moved from that site down to this site. And the lower campus that you see today are those temporary buildings. They're still there. We used to say in the service, there's nothing as permanent as a temporary building. And it proved to be right at Saddleback College as it did at the El Toro Marine Base also, because they still have some buildings over there that are left over from World War II. And Saddleback College still has buildings left over from when we started the campus up on the hospital site. See, the first year, we was over here where the hospital was. But that was a temporary spot. And what was funny was, well, you talk about a funny story was, they planted grass, but they wouldn't let us use the grass. The head custodian in charge of grass wouldn't let us go out there and practice on the grass because it wasn't ready enough, okay? So that's one reason we're traveling all over the place. So it, by the time baseball season, they claimed it was ready. But, but then what, what was the funny thing about it was, then we're going to move next year. We never even touched, we never were able, were able to even get on the grass to practice, you know? When we first, our first buildings, like I said, was up at Mission Hospital and we were in bungalows and we traveled to football practice. We worked out at Capitol High School, the old Capitol High School, down by the Mission. There's an athletic field down there. And every day we would travel down there, get in the cars, the kids would get in the cars, drive them on themselves down there. And we always worried about the insurance part of it and everything, but we couldn't get, we, could, we didn't have buses and money enough to whatever at the beginning. And so we'd always tailgate each other and we'd all go down to the Capital uh, High School down by the Mission in San Juan and work out there every day. Roy Stevens, who was our basketball coach at the time, we worked out at uh, various gyms and community rec centers in the area, and baseball was the same way. We, were, we lived out of suitcases in the back seats of our cars and, and, and went everywhere. And we started out in two model homes across from Mission Viejo High School. Only one of the model homes had plumbing, though. And as a result of that, uh, we often were, uh, those of us who chaired different divisions, mine was science, math, engineering, and technology, would be over in line in the other building because they had two bathrooms. But Jack Roper, who was then the superintendent of the district, insisted on having an executive bathroom. So he and his secretary got to use one bathroom, and about 12 of us got to use the other one. <laughs>
when I came up and interviewed, the administrative offices were at uh, just where you turn in off of La Paz Road to go to, to Mission High School. It was on the, on the left side where that gas station was, just beyond that, with the administration offices. And then the, the college was just the portable buildings being put up at uh, where Mission Community Hospital is now. And so then we were just in the, in the portables there for that, the first year. When I came here in September, I was in uh, the kitchen. I had George Hartman's desk because George was at the Marine base with f fall football practice. They, they had their actual, I think they were in dorms and the whole thing, almost like a four-year school. So I had a desk in the kitchen of one of those model homes that they were in at the time over there on Crisana and uh, in La Paz, across the street from Mission Viejo High School, which is now a gas station and medical building, I believe. So I had, I had an office and I was counseling students in the kitchen in a, with a locked desk. So it was very informal. It was, it was kind of interesting. We were all sort of jammed up in these little cubicles. The classrooms were in temporary buildings, adequate but still kind of a temporary situation. And then they discovered that the college really didn't own the property. There was some sort of <laughs> misunderstanding. And so they had to move 14, 13 or 14, temporary buildings over the hill, and of course ran out of gas, and they thought the students had put sugar in the gas can tanks. It just got to be too funny. Anyway, they finally opened uh, this campus, and our fine arts division, along with some science and math people, we're in cubicles about the size of this chair. <laughs> the desk was about this wide. And there were uh, open doorways. And so you had very little privacy to try to counsel a student or prepare your uh, lectures or anything. Like that. But we were all excited and fun. It was a fun time. Aligning. Uh our, our programs, our academic programs with the universities, which is now called Articulation, uh, we were fortunate enough to hire Bob Jacobson as a counselor, and as we grew, he became the Articulation Officer and Dean of Counseling, uh, one of my people. And Bob was very, a very smart, very astute man, probably the best in, in the state, and it's going to be a real loss when he retires. But he is smart enough to be able to coordinate our, our academics with many of the four-year schools and has a very fine reputation. So he's responsible for a lot of that and working with yourself, the faculty, all the faculty and getting those programs online. And some of them have taken years to get accepted by those universities and it's, it's working with them and he's smart enough to, to work those out. That's an articulation agreement that's very important to the faculty, very important to our students. It's, it's a part that we've used in the recruitment of uh, high school students. That These are programs that are just a, this isn't just a junior college. This is your first two years of a four-year university if that's the way you want to use it. The microbiology program that we put together, or I put together, was pretty much patterned after what I went through when I, I went through college. I, when I was an uh, undergraduate student and graduate student, I worked as a laboratory assistant and uh, student assistant in microbiology. So I had all kinds of practice in uh, preparing materials and, you know, identifying material. That, you know, four years of experience. So it went fairly smoothly, except for the fact that we didn't have much equipment. Uh, you know, in microbiology, basic to the subject is a sterile environment. You have to have a sterile environment to grow your microorganisms in. Well, we were using pressure cookers instead of an autoclave, you know, and this kind of stuff. And uh, it worked out reasonably well. We got uh, our first group of students through, all right, and then it just went on from there. Oral Platt, our mild mannered dean at that time, called me and said, Bob, we're going to start some architecture courses here. And he said, we'd like you to teach them. And I said, RL, I've never taught architecture before. I've never taken an architecture course before. <laughs> and uh, he kind of casually uh, said, um, we need you, and we'll understand if you can't do it perfectly. 
we want you to teach it. It was really kind of a demand to teach it. So I thought a three-semester sequential course in architecture drafting, and I'd be, you know, one page ahead of the students, and there are architecture students, people working in the architect's office, and we'd have arguments <laughs> over, what, you know, what was supposed to be in a certain layout and what have you. So that was a big challenge in starting that program. But the engineering program and the mechanical drafting program were just a lot of effort. When I was interviewed, they wanted a jack of all trades because they couldn't hire that many people. And I was hired to be in charge of the secretarial area. And during the interview, they asked a number of questions such as, can you teach accounting, business law, economics? Uh, and I'd say, well, and try to squirm and give an evasive answer. And they said, well, could you teach intro to computers? And I said, oh, yes, that would be very exciting because I didn't know what a computer was, but I had taught uh, business machines. <laughs> and so I was hired to teach secretarial, typing, shorthand, and introduction to computers. And there was not a computer on campus that first year. Well, what we did was we came up, uh, we came up with four or five different colors and four or five different nicknames. And then we t went to each high school in the district. Now we only had five high schools in the district, okay. That's San Camini, uh, Laguna Beach. Mission was a very new high school, about a year or two old. Tustin and Foothill. So we went to each one of those schools to the senior student body and gave them the ballot and they turned around and uh, they voted. And, uh, we very definitely wanted gauchos because uh, we sort of went along with the land, but also the gauchos uh, I wanted to make sure we'd be able to put the, the Gaucho G on the helmet because I was a big fan of Green Bay Packers, okay, and that's the Green Bay G, okay. So, <coughs> and then the colors, you know, came around along with it, okay. So that's where they were picked each, each, you know, they went all around the school and come up with those colors. I taught journalism and started a newspaper on the side in addition to all uh, the other duties that I continued. And so we had classes at night and then classes during the day, too. And uh, the uh, <coughs> kind of interesting, the, the newspaper, uh, the first issue was called La Prensa, which was in uh, Spanish, uh, meaning the press. Well, why we did that, we wanted the students to name the newspaper. So we said, well, we'll give it a, a foreign name, and then uh, they all come up with an original name. And uh, Gauchos was the name of the, uh, uh, the well, this sobriquet for the football team, Spanish. And so they came up with Lariat. And that's how they got the name uh, Lariat. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, had the Gauchos, I think, it had the G, like the Green Bay Packers, which were <laughs> very popular at that time. So that's why I think they, anyway, they selected the Gauchos, and then the Lariat was select, uh, selected as the name of the newspaper. Well, uh, it was kind of, uh, I guess, uh, stealing, or whatever they call it, uh, looking in other colleges' catalogs and seeing what their programs were and then uh, building the courses that we felt we wanted to start with, which were the very, very basic courses in history, in political science, and uh, psychology and sociology and in time anthropology. And little by little, we added to those basic courses. So when you look in the catalog today or the schedule today, you see all these different exotic classes that cover all kinds of things uh, that we, we wouldn't even imagine back in those days because we just wanted the, a very basic program. I had um, six different preparations the first quarter, six different ones the second quarter, and six more the third quarter. I think the, that continued for the next couple of years until we finally hired enough uh, other math instructors so that so that people could have maybe only three or four preparations <laughs> in a quarter. And it was just, you were on a treadmill all of the time. It was interesting. One of the things that the faculty used to always kind of grumble about a little bit was that, and I don't remember how many years it went on, was that we had to, in the old days, the first 10 years or so, we, the faculty was required to stand behind the, um, the tables and all the tickets for the classes, the ticket numbers would be in, in computer form in little cards, 
and we would have to put in an hours and the students would come through and show us and then we would hand out the cards to each student well if you're there and students are and if you if you can sense that your class doesn't have enough you could start pressing students well now this class over here by this person or me take me in and so a lot of times students would just oh okay well what's your name Bill Otter or something so but there was a lot of things going back on in those days of uh, it was all legal and legitimate because we had a personal contact a lot more with all the students in the first 10 years because we weren't as large and we always had to help them at registration that was just part of that first week of school and it was the old time like when you and I were when I was in college you'd go up and you'd go through the 22 stations and get your class cards well that's the way we started here and uh, uh, then some of the instructors uh, I think Bill Holston and Paul Brennan used to get into little word battles with each other because they were trying to get their class larger than Paul's class in political science and Holston who everybody knows was you know the most favorite and most sought after teacher here on campus they would used to have bids and fights between who could get to 50 first and all this kind of stuff. Usually when we started off, I think most of those, there were only about uh, 15 in the, in the classes to start with. And some of them, I, I was looking there up around 18 to no, 20, 22. But there, actually, there were some of the, the better students. You know, back then, there was still the, such a thing called as the draft for the military. And so, you know, it wasn't... Uh, dropping out of school as much and, and when they when no one drops it's hard to be the first one to drop and you have a half a dozen drop it's easy for you to you know, drop out and, were, and the students were were pretty good to the the program was structured I, I think there was a thought then even academically with the academics that we hire good high school uh, teachers and counselors and we train them in the saddleback way whatever that was in the summer between the first and second year, when those buildings were getting ready to be moved, we had to get out. And so the, the department chairs worked in the summer, but we moved over to Crown Valley Elementary School, where the, uh, the, the uh, prized possession at Crown Valley Elementary School was an adult-sized chair, because there was only one in each room, and, and we were in offices, and they stored most of, the, of our equipment and down um, in some storage areas over by Forbes Road off Crown Valley Parkway. And uh, not all of it showed up again when we <laughs> moved back into the buildings after they'd been moved. Bobcats. Mud. Rats and varmints. Huge mass of frogs. Snakes. And deer. Rattlesnakes. Raccoons. Bunnies. Coyotes. <laughs> and building was where all of the faculty were and probably uh, started the, the togetherness. That first year, end building. Uh, was a bullpen. You didn't have offices in it. You just had the whole thing was open and you had uh, your your office mate would be whoever you backed up your your desk to. So there were a whole series of desks that were backed up to each other. Uh, and and if a phone call came in, hey Jean, you've got a phone call out of line one or something like that. Uh, it was so everybody was all together in this end building, and we did uh, uh, any of the handouts to students were done on a ditto machine. Do you remember the old ditto machines, the old purple things that I mean, you'd just be purple from head to toe. Uh, it was it was a wild time. Then we get it and cut a mimeograph machine. Then you could be blue and black at the same time. So the next year, it was decided that there wasn't much privacy, so they built offices in end building, except they built them, and they were individual offices, but they looked like uh, toilet stalls. <laughs> and there was just room enough for a file cabinet, uh, your desk, uh, your chair as a faculty member, and one other chair for a student to sit at. So it was, it was really tight. Uh, but the funny part about it was that everybody on three cubicles to either side and across the hallway could hear every word that was being exchanged between student and faculty members. So there was no privacy anyhow. But it, it, was, it was a funny looking building. We were, uh, the women, were told that we could not wear slacks, capris, 
golfing shorts, tennis dresses, anything that revealed um, that we were not not really proper ladies. So we all almost had to pass this <laughs> dress code. <laughs> One of the questions in interviewing for the job was, will you uh, back us up with this dress code business? You know, we have to have uh, shoes and shirts and, and, and cut hair. You can't have ponytails. You can't have earrings. Boys can't have earrings. And, and so we all sort of laughed at that. And when we were building you know, our, the chemistry building, when they were putting in the, in the fume hoods and they were going to be downdraft, fume hoods were went down underneath the, the building, you know, or underneath the room, so you didn't see the pipes blocking your view. But the, the plan you know, was just didn't work. They started in the, in the chemistry end with a, a nine inch pipe and it kept getting a little larger as it went down. And there's a break between the chemistry and, and the biology section. And then it gets picked up from, from the biology. And then finally, the second to the last lab, so there are five labs. And then the, the second to the lab, last lab, the pipe is 40 inches you know, in diameter. And I try to tell them, well, they're going to suck students out of the biology lab before they move any, any fumes out of, the, out of the chemistry. Because the break in the building Every time it goes around a you know a ninety degree turn, you lose a, a great percent of the the flow of air, and so when we would have the when I was teaching the Chem One C, where we had the hydrogen sulfide, the fumes were so so bad in there that I had lost you know, essentially all my my sense of smell. I couldn't smell you know what gasoline smells like. Couldn't smell like perfume. Or any of it, and then they said, "Well, you put fans in the doors. You know, we'll share the wealth." Every night during the week, I'll go in two two players' home. Every night, I visit the parents and all. And see, we had lots of rumors going around because the rumors going around that we we're going to be going to school in tents and all that stuff. And lots of people up in Tustin was very upset because their students were always going to go to uh, Seneca College. So we're so it was up to me also to straighten all that out and and visit with the parents and show them what type of program we were trying to have and everything. And we had, we got good reception from the parents once, but I was in there every night with the parents and the houses. Okay, but it was very I gained weight with all the all the goodies, you know. <laughs> there was a lot of dirt and and the surrounding hillsides were covered with uh, dry grass and cactus. And th there, there was a little pavement from one building to the other, and there was one patch of green lawn that I recall, with a flagpole and the, the state and national flag flying on it. And when you come on campus in the morning, Fred Bremer was always sort of patrolling around just to see if you were dressed properly and that sort of thing. The women were not allowed to uh, wear pants or long skirts, which were in fashion then. So we were kind of checked to make sure that we were, you know, kosher. I think, you know, just uh, working with administration <laughs> was a challenge. And, uh, you know, when I was at San Jose State, we had a few riots there. I had to, I couldn't teach a few classes because of tear gas, you know. And so the board and the administration was very, was very attuned to the issue of writing in colleges at that time. So basically they came here in a, in a mentality of the, the students and the faculty are potentially dangerous. You know? <laughs> so they tried to hire conservative faculty. I don't think it exactly worked that way. And, you know, you probably heard the dress codes and both for the faculty and the students, uh, flag salutes in the morning. Um, it was like shocking for me uh, to be walking across campus, even though I knew it happened. Somehow I had never been out on campus when it happened. I think it was like 8 o'clock in the morning they'd uh, play the national anthem over outside speakers. People would stop and put their hand, <laughs> their hand over their chest. It was like, holy mackerel. I mean, the whole student, body, every, everyone would stop. So they were like in this mentality that, hey, we're going to keep this campus cool. We're going to keep the students with short hair, the faculty with ties, but we don't want anything to get out of hand. So they were, um, they were a little difficult to deal with. I think our, our college started with the idea that 
a dress code or at least some part of saying this is the way it's going to be. It happened to be the dress code. It could have been something else and saying we're going to have control. And that was part of going back to the federal, federal money. We want to have control. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. This is our college. And those five board members pretty well lived that way and believed that way, and that was their philosophy. Uh, I think that the, the, the one story going back to the dress code, though, was that I usually was at the first station of registration. And that's where the screening took place of, uh, of mainly the, the boys and the hair length. The girls, uh, you know, wasn't a big problem. There was supposed to be a skirt length, but I don't think anybody paid any attention to that other than to look. And in this case, it was the boy's hair that was a big thing. It couldn't be over the collar or over the ears. And so all here comes Rudy, my barber from Laguna Beach, downtown Laguna. He's still barbering, styling now. He comes to the first station of registration. And guess who's there at the first station? Jack. I said, Rudy, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be able to register. Your hair's too long. And so Rudy wasn't able to register. And I don't think I went back to get a haircut from him either. Uh, there were some policies that the board made that we didn't like. Uh, the, the clipping the hair policy was one that uh, most of the faculty was not really very happy about. And in fact, uh, there were some clashes when they tried to enforce that by pulling people out of the classroom and telling them they had to get haircuts. They basically said, you, you guys should be doing this outside of the classroom. And, um, we wrestled with that issue, and uh, it got resolved eventually. The board sort of backed off the policy, although they went to court and, got, and won the right to tell students that they, uh, they have a dress code and a, a hair code, uh, in, at least in the lower court. But they actually had abandoned it before that because one of the members of the Board of Trustees wouldn't have been able to be a student here because, you know, in, back in those 70s, the hairstyles were changing and getting longer and so forth. And he, Pat Backus was a little hipper than the rest, and he had longer hair. So uh, it would have been interesting if they hadn't backed off that policy. Now, of course, there was challenges with the, the students. We're talking about the, the Vietnam period. And so we had a period where students were advocating free speech <laughs> to the extreme. And uh, on the other hand, uh, perhaps there was a bit of regimentation to the extreme <laughs> that was in conflict. Uh, the board had a policy and the administration had a policy of, you know, they loved the term no nonsense. Uh, and the students, on the other hand, they wanted free speech. So uh, a dress code was uh, instituted. And that caused a problem uh, because on the college level, the students thought that they were being mistreated. And it was a time, too, I suppose, that the people who were involved in music wanted to have their long hair <laughs> to uh, portray the image that they thought they should uh, portray. And, uh, but they had to cut their hair if they wanted to come to the college. And so this called some uh, a strife and a challenge but uh, it, uh, it was resolved. You know, we had two, um, I guess you had those who were opposed to the Vietnam War, and then you had uh, veterans of the Vietnam War who returned to the campus. So we had uh, two factions. Uh, we had uh, official flag raising on campus at that time that was supported by uh, the uh, veterans who had returned. And, uh, of course, the others didn't relish the effect that they were supposed to uh, get out of their cars at the time, <laughs> like a, a base, you know, and, and watch uh, the, the flag being raised. We didn't have any medical insurance. And we went along for about three years without medical insurance. And so uh, one day I went into Dr. Bremer and I said, uh, uh, how about uh, working up some sort of a medical insurance program? And Dr. Bremer says, oh, well, the board will never go for that. They'll never go for that. I said, well, why don't we work it up and try it? He says, well, OK, if you want to, he says, it's your time. Go ahead. So I found out who the insurance agent was for the board at Saddleback College, which was an insurance agency up in Tustin. So I went up to Tustin and walked in and started talking to the people up there. And I said, we need a health insurance program at Saddleback College. I said, do you think you can work one up? 
They said, oh, yeah, sure, we can work one out. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to make money on this. So uh, I said, well, let's work it up and we'll present it to the board. So they worked it all up and we scheduled it on the agenda for the board. And um, the insurance people showed up and uh, I made the presentation and they kind of backed me up. And Dr. Bremer was there, of course, saying, you know, they'll never approve this, they'll never approve that. So when I got through with my presentation, one of the board members, Hans Vogel, his name was, I don't know if anybody else has mentioned him, but uh, he leaned forward and he looked down at me and Dr. Bremer and he says, now, that's what we need in this district. <laughs> and Dr. Bremer went, and he looked, <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, Hans, that's what we need in this district. <laughs> Early on, getting involved in faculty politics was a challenge for me. Uh, the first year I was here, I was uh, somehow appointed, elected or something, as grievance chairperson. Well, see, at that time, nobody had tenure. and. There was a lot of controversy about, you know, regulations and so forth. So there were some uh, confrontations and some challenges in meeting that uh, role. And that was kind of interesting. One of the funniest things, I guess, that happened was one of Joanne Bennett's students, I think this was probably the second year, took off all of his clothes and put a hood over his head and ran through the faculty offices. And it was like, it was like Porky the movie, you know, well, I think I could identify him because he had a wart. <laughs> I think it's really neat not to make it just applied math, but to actually understand physics. And I had this uh, Vietnamese girl, Quang, I'm not positive, but I'd never forget this. She did, we had this quite difficult lab to do, and she was almost legally blind, and you have to look through this telescope and make Millikan's oil drop experiment to measure the charge on the electron. So I had people working on this, and it's kind of tedious. I did it when I was at Oxy, and I said to her one day, she turned this thing, and I said, did you really measure this? She said, and she kind of hesitated. I said, now, how much time did you spend? Did you really measure Well, I just sort of copied it. But then she decided she was really going to do it. And she probably spent, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 hours doing it. And, uh, you know, I sort of caught her. And she decided, all right, I will do what's really do the right thing. You know, and I thought that was a great story. And it's funny. I was thinking, I was thinking about that first group of students and how diverse they were. There were, of course, the students who were fresh out of high school and total innocence, new to the world. And there were the returning students and the older students. Leisure World was new at the time and the college being here was an exciting opportunity for people who were moving there. And then of course this was in the middle of the Vietnam War and there were students who were here as wannabe hippies, uh, the people from my hometown <laughs> coming over from Laguna Beach with their beads and their prairie skirts. And some of the young men who were here because they didn't want to be drafted. And then there was a sizable group of veterans who had just come back from combat. So you had these four groups of people who were all, in, in a way, in their background so different, and yet, as I say, in that first group of students became like a big family. And I think it was so good for them, and I know it was so good for me, because I was very young and in a lot of ways inexperienced at the time, and just the opportunity to be with those people and to work with them and to get to know them was one of the most wonderful aspects of those early years. My favorite school story, I think, is I actually did do this. 
when we were on the original campus, there wasn't enough electricity. And I knew where the electric panels were, where the circuit breakers are. They weren't too far from the physics building. So afternoon, the power would go off. And it was pretty routine, particularly at the beginning of school when it was hot. So I, w I had stuff going on in lab. I needed electricity. So I would actually go over to where these circuit breakers were and turn off the administration building. I turned off Red Bremer and whoever else was down there and turned on physics. Now, ultimately, they caught me, and they locked it up and said, okay, you can't be doing that. But I thought my priorities were appropriate, that I should. And the physics needed the power more than the paper shufflers. You know? When we were in the first year on, on this campus, was still in a temporary between, and so we were chemistry, or chemistry on one side and, and the physics on the on the other, and the stock room was in between, and I was going into the stock room to get something, and Bob Parsons was there, and pretty soon he started backing away from the, from the blackboard, and he backed away of where the students were, and so I stuck my head in the door, and I said, what's wrong? He said, there's a hornet, there's a hornet right over by the blackboard where he was writing. So I just, I walked over there, and I took one swipe, and I knocked it down onto the floor, went over and stepped on it, and I said, and the students causing you problems? <laughs> we had a number of students that ended up being the outstanding uh, business student or the outstanding, they called it data processing in, in those uh, days, and that went on to join the staff. Um, Lola Attinger was one, and she was hired. She was an outstanding secretarial student, and she was hired full-time, and Pat Sullivan, that is still very much a part of our business division was an outstanding student that was then hired as a full-time faculty member. I don't know if people mentioned that, you know, the, the athletic, uh, the volleyball courts and basketball courts are right within the, um, you have to pass them, go to some classes and go to the parking lot. So a lot of us faculty would be playing volleyball with the students and what have you. And then there's students kind of getting our case like we're getting old or something. I was only 27 at the time, but there was like, you guys are old, you're not capable. So we organized the first and only intercollegiate, not intercollegiate, yeah, intercollegiate um, three-man basketball contest. And so uh, myself and Roy Stevens was the basketball coach and Bob Parsons who had played basketball in college. And then we got the best student, Eric Christensen, and we won. <laughs> and we're currently the three-man basketball champion of Southback College because they never had it again. Uh, when he first came over to this campus on the lower lower part of it, T building, I was able to get a greenhouse, a small greenhouse. And everything was going along well there until one day the superintendent president called me in and wanted to know what those marijuana plants were doing <laughs> in the greenhouse. Well, uh, Evidently, I had a young student at that time who thought that was a good place to put them together, so that was kind of funny. So I had to talk my way through that. But I think one of the longest lasting student experiences that I was involved in had to do with the Vietnam War. And we had some uh, Green Berets, and several of them were in my art appreciation class. And UCI, at that time, came over with a group of students in buses to take down our American flag. And that didn't work at all. Because the Green Berets got elbow to elbow. My students jumped out of the classroom, started opening classroom doors. Hey, you, hey, you, ex, you know, whatever they called each other. Get your out here. And so they stood, you know, like, like this and like this, and told UCI students that this was their campus and they were not going to take the flag down. So the faculty was all sort of standing around the buildings on the outside watching what was going to happen. But these wonderful students just took care of the situation, ushered these kids back onto this bus and away they went back to UCI. And that was the last we saw. Probably uh, one, of the, uh, one of the funniest was uh, during registration when the when everybody in the faculty had to work registration in the registration line, way before computers and phone-in registration and all that. So the student actually came to the registration uh, station, first station, with a little ticket in hand, 
and was screened as far as the dress code is concerned, which you may want to know more about later. And uh, so if you pass the test at the first station of the dress code, then you got to come in. And there was a station for each division then in, I think it was S building or R building, Q building. How about Q building? And that's where each faculty uh, division was represented. So you had a chance to recruit your own students in those days. And so that's where some counseling went on as well from the fac faculty themselves. And uh, counseling was represented there, all the divisions, so you had a chance to meet students. And uh, I think one of the, the story was probably that a young man showed up, he had long, long hair. And he showed up with a body cast that he had borrowed from a friend so the body cast came up to the neck and he was able to tuck his hair into the uh, body cast and he tried to get through registration that way. We were asked, the first group uh, of teachers, of faculty, were asked to act as chaperones, not chaperones, but ushers and, and kind of oversee the first or second graduation. And it was, it was kind, of, uh, uh, kind of an interesting challenge, so our friend Pat Gregnon uh, always had his ladies down to her house in Dana Point for lunch. And she said, I'm taking all my clothes off except my underwear. And we'll put our gowns over the top of this and we will go to this graduation, which we did after about a quart of wine. So here we are in these black, shiny, with just our undies on underneath it. So that's the way we met challenge. I mean, we got together and we just had fun with it. So it was never really threatening. Um, we had a couple of really strong women, and I have to thank Jean Vincenzi uh, for acting as our sort of spokesperson and helping us kind of laugh at the situation, although I understand she has a, uh, an ulcer over all that activity. <laughs> but we kept our sense of humor, and uh, so the, the challenges uh, to making the classroom work turned out to be tons of I mean, we took it with a sense of humor, seriously. Uh, but in the end, we felt that we were the, the winners, the survivors. You'd be out here in football practice, and <clears throat> you got deer walking around, and we have rattlesnakes all over the place, you know. And we actually have uh, people at lunchtime, uh, a couple of times they were sitting on a blacktop, and the rattlesnakes come out, and they reach back, and we had a couple people bit my rattlesnakes. Well, I had uh, just a few years ago um, a woman who went through this campus after having been attacked, um, having her face disfigured and blinded, uh, who came to class with her dog. Um, and even though she couldn't see the blackboard, um, listened because um, for uh, I'd had some blind students before, and I'd kind of learned that, that if you repeat everything you're writing on the blackboard. Uh, they've developed the skill to, to listen to that. She got an A in the class, and uh, uh, I, I blatantly used it to shame a few of the other students in the class who complain about, you know, not they're going too fast or something like that. Well, you know, she's getting it, uh, and uh, she's getting perfect scores on the quizzes. So uh, the fact that we deal with such a wide range of people, um, the best thing that. I ever did at Saddleback College turned out to be the interdisciplinary studies program, which unfortunately has kind of petered out. But at the time, we won a couple of awards from the National Endowment for the Humanities. It really was um, Bob Lombardi and Jody Hoy's idea, but we had a group of people get together and, and create these courses which were cross-disciplinary, and we have as many as six faculty members, um, 120 students, and then we met in small group sections too, and we brought in all kinds of, uh, of great people. One of the great experiences under this program was jointly with uh, Fine Arts and Doyle McKinney, uh, Maya Angelou came here to, uh, to do a, a joint session of all of our interdisciplinary studies classes uh, from 313, I remember, just packed. And she was working on a musical, which she sang for us a cappella. And then getting a chance to go to Doyle's house and meet with her afterwards as one of the faculty was a great thing. We had um, one of my former Harvard faculty members, who at the time was named Richard Alpert, uh, but little did I know at the time was doing um, experiments with Timothy Leary, 
and later on went to India and became Baba Ram Das. And he came uh, in robes and sat to cross-legged uh, there and, uh, uh, on the desk in front of the room and shared philosophy. Unfortunately, what we found out was that the guy had kind of come full circle, and now he was doing corporate seminars to uh, help corporate executives get in touch with themselves. I liked it when we were small because we had lots more close knit. We knew everybody. Uh, for example, even uh, even the first two or three years, the whole the faculty. You know, I, I remember after every football game, we'd have a party, get together at somebody's house, and the whole faculty would come, besides the coaches. You know, but now we got so you get so big, you lose contact with people. You know. You never see anybody you work with, you know. Oh, uh, there. Uh, the, I think the biggest change was one of attitude, and it was so good to have a loosening up. Um, a, a, in the beginning, there were so many restrictions on dress, and and um, it, it was very structured, very very structured, and. Probably for good reason. Uh, the building that we're sitting in right now looks like a fort, and it was built like a fort because at that time it was felt that we needed a fort uh, in order to um, save ourselves from these radical students who were having sit-ins and uh, uh, and and threatening the administration. So uh, th that uh, the attitude that that caused this building to look as it looks, uh, left about, I'd say, well, by the time Dr. Lombardi came on, things had changed considerably. And there was a great loosening up. And then we went through a period of time when we got to try all kinds of new things. We sat in circles. We, uh, uh, we got to experiment with uh, teaching methods. And I, I really enjoyed that time. Then it kind of settled down into using the best of the past and the best of the experimentation. And I think um, Saddleback, uh, at least the time I retired, which was in 1986, but at the time I retired, it, uh, a good meeting place had come between the tightness and and then the experimentation you noticed how i dressed today for this interview because this was the accepted dress at the time when the college started uh, the order was that all men had to wear coat and ties and women could not wear pantsuits they had to wear dresses and that was the order of the day and so uh, this is uh, the way that it was. Now, you want me to contrast it with today? <laughs> Just walk around the campus and take a look. I see some uh, instructors teaching classes in shorts, which uh, would not have ever uh, happened in those days, you see. And also, I knew one or two of the instructors, they only had one coat. So they had to wear the same coat every day. Of course, you could take the coat off in the classroom, so, but you had to wear a tie. And again, some of them had very few ties and never wore ties, and so they did with what they had and uh, to get by. But that was one big change. We started out with, I think it was right around 1,000 students that first year. And of course now it's, what, I don't even know, 27, 28,000. Uh, as a result, you, you get the uh, splintering of uh, Groups so that you don't have uh, you don't have people who are uh, majoring in the fine arts having any contact whatsoever with the people who are majoring in the sciences or mathematics. Uh, and in those days, you did. I mean, it just by necessity, you had to. They were all in the same classes. Uh, there weren't that many classes. None of the classes were larger than thirty. Uh, that's all that the rooms would hold. <laughs> we, we didn't have any more room. Uh, so that was obvious. The, the, uh, the acceptance of a statement from a, a person in authority 
uh, had it became it became quite changed as I finally finished up my teaching career. I I think as being a, a faculty member that's been here and seen all the, a lot of, or every change that's happened at one time or another, I would have to say that the beginning faculty people were very would be very excited about uh, each building as it opened up. Because like I said earlier, we would walk from down below all the way up to the library, you know. And most of the time we didn't come up unless we had to come up. But as soon as the science math building got in, that was the number two building. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was it. Then we started getting, then they had more classrooms and then the campus started being split more. But you had reasons to come up here and everything. But again, uh, the openings for those kinds of things was, was really exciting back in those days because a lot of people don't realize that former governor Ronald Reagan was here on our campus. He helped uh, do some groundbreaking way back in the beginning and there were a lot of, uh, we don't, dignitaries back then used to go to these things. Where now if things open up, it's just if you can get your local mayor from Mission Viejo, that's, that you're doing good. But back then you'd get, because there were a lot of money from state funds and things like that coming in and and uh, these the governors and people would come through and uh, it was neat to be seeing those people and talking to those people and things like that and uh, but uh, yeah it was an exciting time I think the buildings and things and then as we added some sports as we went along because we only started with about five or six sports and now we're up to men and women somewhere around 18 17 or 18 men's sports when we first started off we were you know, being a small group of only 28 the, the first year and then a complement to about the same number the next year. And so we were, we were a family. And we used to, on Friday afternoon, you know, after classes were over, we'd usually go down uh, you know, and play pool at some place and have a beer or two. And, and, and then as the place kept getting larger and larger, you sort of lost those things. We sent, spent several years on what's called the lower campus and building in, and we saw the library building go up, and we saw the math science building go up, and we saw the liberal arts building go up, and we were still in building in, and, event, and eventually we got the business science and general studies building. So just the, the, the change of the looks of the campus through the years uh, with the buildings. And along the way, you get segmented and departmentalized and you lose a little bit of that immediacy of the, we all stayed here till four o'clock in the morning and we didn't have any lunch or dinner, but we did it together. So like everything else, it's a trade-off, but it's been thrilling to see the college grow in terms of physical facilities, in terms of certainly staffing. Think of all the great people who were brought on even from, from the second year, we started to pick up wonderful, wonderful staff members. And then the phenomenal growth in the student body from a thousand students to whatever it is now. I think at the time I retired, it was 28,000 and it's probably more now. And to see the college become such a vital and almost taken for granted asset to the community. It's, it's there for everybody from the kids fresh out of high school to the, the uh, probably emeritus students that I saw as I was coming up from the parking lot today, coming up to the campus on a Saturday morning to enrich their lives. That the college really does reach out to every facet of the community. And of course, that's what you want a college to do, so that's very exciting. The changes that I've seen, are the growth of the institution of buildings, a beautiful, beautiful campus and buildings, but I, I, I don't know that we have the, the togetherness, the teamwork that we used to have in the old days. And I say you never go back to the old days, but uh, I think we were more of a team in, in the first 10, 15 years. And having been here 30 years, as you grow, you lose track of people. You, don't, you aren't able to, to, to make contact with those people on a, on a daily basis, like when we were a small school of 800 students in 1968. You know, it, it's, it's difficult that way. You, you lose something. 
as far as the heart, the heart's here. I think that the community college is, uh, the whole idea of it is, is germane to what I think we should be focusing on as far as uh, education in this country. Uh, it's open for everyone. It's, uh, uh, we have, I've, I've had contact with students who have been anywhere from 16 to 80 years old. Uh, and this is, this is just been, for me personally, it's been such a uh, widening experience. I, I, I think Saddleback. I think it was a great experience. I really enjoyed being here. I taught here for 30 years of my life, which is uh, a little over half of it. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, I have a real strong feeling for Saddleback College and what happened here. Um, I asked my son the other day, I said, what would you say about the faculty here? Because he graduated, not graduated, but he came here for a couple of years. 10 years ago. And he said, uh, they're substantial, you know. And uh, that's substantial. He said, and, and in addition to being substantial, they have a passion for their work, and um, they really understand their subject matter. And somehow, I don't know the word substantial stood out for me, there's a quality about the faculty here of um, substance, of um, integrity, of uh, wanting what's best. And even through all these crises and what have you, that substantialness and passion for their subject matter and passion for teaching has held the school together and, and created really a great learning environment. So uh, I think that's the best thing. And we had uh, student and faculty picnics on campus with tons of, of things like throwing eggs at each other and catching them, um, uh, riding uh, piggyback on Frank Sharada <laughs> shoulders. <laughs> Uh, stomping on balloons in each other's feet. I mean, it was, it was a panic. And really wonderful memories. This is a really good job for the reasons that most people here know, and that is that you're free to teach, you're paid well to teach, you have good, by and large, good students. You do not have to do research, and research is a problem. I've been there. You've probably been there. I've been to UCLA where people didn't have the time of day for you, they had to do this publisher parish deal, and I think the community college system is just a marvelous deal, and I think it's an incredible bargain. And high school, to high school students, if you're watching here, go here, don't go unless you have some reason to go to UC Berkeley or something, because this is a much better deal. And to the faculty, you can't have a better job than you paid well, you have reasonable hours, you have a nice area, I mean, how can you beat it? To begin with are the students, people that have come through that I've had in class, the athletic teams of, of certain individuals always come in. Um, I think we have a lot of great faculty people. Uh, Len, I've known you for many, many years. We don't see, we see each other three or four times in a, in a year or two times a semester, but there's a real, real strength of camaraderie here at Saddleback. I, in some ways, I think Irvine Valley has their camaraderie, but we don't really inter, intermingle too much because they have different kinds of problems than what we have here. And, and, uh, and I think overall, the, we're real, real close in many, many ways here. Even though when there's a lot of friction and things going on in the area, people kind of back off a little bit. But when people have to come together, I think we're real good about that here. I cannot separate it from what was happening in my personal life also. So um, it was special to me as a, as a person because it gave me a chance to, uh, to express myself in a way that I truly love to do. I, I always felt that uh, I, I was cheating somebody because here I was doing exactly what I wanted to do, the freedom to do it in a way I wanted to do it, and I got paid for it. And I, uh, there were times when they had to remind me to come pick up my paycheck. It's not because I didn't need the money. I, I certainly did need the money, 
but I, I just I, I wasn't working for the money. It, it was a, a pleasure the whole time. I think we're, we are special, exceptional, because of the way we started with the faculty that we started with, with the students in the area. As I went into counseling from administration, I like to say to parents and students, we are good because you are good. We are in an area where we have a lot of things to be thankful for. Uh, excellent high schools, excellent high school teachers, excellent high school students that feed into to Saddleback. And uh, I think that's one of our real strengths is one, we're still able to have small classes. We have still an outstanding faculty and we're inexpensive, not cheap, inexpensive. And if you really want those kinds of things, you're not going to find them at four-year schools, you're going to find them here. And I like to, as I was doing the outreach for, for the college, to be competitive with those people. Because sometimes those four-year school people are kind of sit back, well, we get all these students anyway. We've got 35,000 students. So I like to say, we have something special to offer you. We have small classes. We have a faculty that cares about you. You're going to get to know the faculty if you want to, and vice versa. I thought it it always had a had a, a good reputation as being an outstanding educational institution, and I think that was you know one of the things. And you look at the the, the type of people that that were hired. Uh, I was, as I had said before, you know, president of statewide California Association of Chemistry Teachers. Uh, Gene Vinzanzi and uh, Jim Thorpe were statewide on, you know, academic senate. Uh, geology Minch was the you know, head of uh, statewide, you know, in geology, and so faculty were involved in education, not only in in teaching. That's hard to say. I mean, there were so many things: the people I worked with, the students, the the excitement of developing new programs, uh, just being a part of it all. Special thing we been that we've in my athletic field that we've had some we have some outstanding, just real good citizen people, students that come to school here, you know, and have a, I mean had great backing from the parents, and the students give you everything everything you ask for. I always say 110 percent. Not 100 percent, 110 percent. I enjoyed it all. I think maybe the thing that stands out most is my love for learning. And uh, when I came here, I became a true lifelong learner because I was one of the first students to ever enroll in a class at this college. Uh, my number was in the hundreds. So that stands out as one of my great experiences here at this college. And I've taken many courses and uh, enjoyed them all, learned a lot, and still love learning. Now, community college is uh, very unique. We didn't really have those in Ohio. And uh, they've gone to uh, where I grew up, and they, they've gone to kind of off-campus centers of the universities. And I don't think they work quite as well as the community colleges really an apt name because uh, we do all kinds of things and we're really integrated in the community and uh, uh, most of us live here or close to here and so uh, we, uh, we participate in the lives of the students uh, in and out of the classroom and they and ours. Well, thinking back though, you know, you sit back and you read the pages of history. I, today, sometimes I think, damn, wouldn't it be fun to tear it down and start all over again? <laughs>